Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The College of Complexes is now in session. We would request everybody to please take their seats. Our speaker has shown up. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have our a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak for up to about an hour or so. And then we'll have a question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. During the uh, question and answer period, we ask to keep a, ask a question and not make statements because you have plenty of time to do that during our rebuttal period. We have two rules at the College of Complexes. The first one is no. The first one is one fool at a time. The second one is no personal attacks. So let's get started with these here announcements. And the first announcement we're going to have is these fill. These will be filmed and put up onto YouTube. You can find past episodes of the College of Complexes on my YouTube channel, or you can go to the College of Complexes website at www.collegeofcomplexes.org. Click on the camera icon, and you'll be there for, you'll see about 10 years of archival College of Complexes footage. Let's get with the announcements. There is an art to good writing and a good book. Tonight, our author, David Ramsey Steele, will discuss his new book, The Mystery of Fascism. Let's give a rousing round warm of applause for David Ramsey Steele. Right, right on the side there, Dave. Yeah. Well, <coughs> fellow members of the human species, and anybody else who may be paying attention, um, my new book is a collection of the things I've written over the years. Um, and the title is The Mystery of Fascism, David Ramsey Steele's Greatest Hits. If you look at the cover, you might think it's Greatest Tits but it's actually greatest hits. Um, and it covers a wide range of subjects. Um, some of the things I discuss in the various chapters in the book are um, why we're not living in a simulation, uh, the Dexter TV show and what it tells us about modern ideology, why it's morally OK to eat meat, the fallacies of Ayn Rand, that's fallacies, not fallacies. Um, and the bigotry of the new atheists. Um, <clears throat> but um, so I, I do explain to people that, that it's like an album where you sometimes give an album the title of the single that was the most popular. And many of my articles over the years have been taken up and constantly referred to and discussed. Um, but the one that's the most uh, celebrated is The Mystery of Fascism. So that's why I gave that title to the, to the book. Uh, but I found that there is a, a magic in words. Um, and people want me to talk about fascism because the word fascism is in the book. So, uh, you know, when you, when you publish a book in the final stages, you have to go through it and proofread it. Um, and when you, get as, uh, when you get, as I have, into the second half of your eighth decade, your mind often wanders. So I would sometimes be proofreading the book and I would sort of come back to it and I think, this is bloody brilliant. Uh, who wrote this? Oh yeah, I remember. Uh, so it's worth reading. Um, I'm a good writer and my stuff is worth reading. Now, <clears throat> I want to I'm going to talk about fascism, but I'll entertain questions about anything, because I know about everything. Um, so, uh, as you can tell from the book, right? So, um, fascism is a very widely used term, um, and it's, um, it seems to be becoming increasingly widely used today. Um, and it's used in all kinds of different ways, and it changes slightly all the time. A few months ago, I noticed that various people, like Tucker Carlson, have started calling China fascist China. 
you know, uh, they used to call it just China or sometimes communist China. Um, because China is ruled by a communist party or something that calls itself a communist party. Uh, but so what this seems to mean is when Tucker Carlson started calling China fascist China, he meant it was very, very, China is very, very bad. Um, you know in this country at the moment the big issue is the left wants to uh, start a war with Russia and the right wants to start a war with China. Um, I don't want to start a war with anybody. Uh, I'd rather have peace, but uh, that's just my little eccentricity. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the, in the early 2000s people started talking about Islamo-fascism and what they meant was that some uh, Islamic regime, some regimes populated and ruled by Muslims uh, were very, very bad. That seems to be what they meant. Um, and there is, a, there is an organization called Antifa, or Antifa, as they would prefer to be, to be pronounced. And Antifa is short for anti-fascist. And a lot of people will tell you that Antifa is itself fascist. And that's an interesting observation, and I think that in, the gist of it is correct. But of course, typically in the history uh, of uh, Europe in the, in the 20s and 30s, the fascist thug element, the, the stormtroopers or the black shirts, were formed in response to leftist violence. So why not say uh, Antifa is Bolshevik or communist, um, because um, those people were just as violent as the fascists. Um, so fascism as a term originated in Italy, and it's a particular regime in Italy, which started in the 1922. Uh, but it was also then later applied, some years later, uh, to Germany, National Socialist Germany. Even though National Socialist Germany didn't call itself fascist and actually distinguished itself from fascism. Um, so if you're going to call both fascist Italy and National Socialist Germany fascist, that means you've got a very general term and you've got to call a lot of other regimes fascist as well. And of course there were a lot of dictatorial regimes that sprung up in Europe in the 20s and 30s, all over Europe really, except uh, for a few countries like Holland and Scandinavian countries and Britain and Ireland, where there were fascist movements, but they were very small. Um, so, um, with, the, with the big exception of, uh, of um, Germany, these movements that we now tend to call fascists uh, are, are phenomena of, of fairly backward, uh, Roman Catholic dominated agrarian uh, countries. Um, so I just want to emphasize that um, people use the word fascist to mean terribly bad and this leads to rather strange consequences. I mean consider this. Um, if, you, if you read about what went on in the 30s, you'll read many references to fascist Italy. But you will very rarely come across uh, that phrase, fascist Italy, right? which is fair enough, they called themselves fascists, right? Um, but you won't read uh, many references to fascist Austria before the Germans took it over, right? Um, and you won't read many references to fascist Poland before the Germans and the Russians took it over in 1939. So, um, and, th and I think that's because we're in the habit of thinking of Austria and then later Poland as being victims of Nazi expansion. So it seems incongruous to call them fascists because they're the victims. So you see how uh, this, the, the language becomes distorted um, because um, uh, actually I, about a year ago I, I came across a reference to fascist Poland and I thought that's odd. And it took me back, you know, in the 1960s I used to um, I used to read all the left-wing groups that were publishing stuff in Britain, and some of them were Maoists who therefore felt obliged to defend Stalin because they were, because they were against the Khrushchev revisionists and the, the Soviet Union had been perfect up until Khrushchev. So, uh, and, and when they wrote about what happened in the Second World War, they would talk about fascist Poland. So that's what I remember uh, when I came across this reference to fascism.
So, <coughs> another example of this tendency to use the word fascist to just mean very, very bad um, is, uh, I'll give you this example. Uh, when I've talked to various people about uh, what happened in the 30s, um, I have often made the statement, which I do believe, that General Franco, Francisco Franco Bahamonte, who was a dictator of the Spanish from 1939 to 1975 when he died. Um, that General Franco was not a fascist, um, and which I would defend. Uh, the thing that's interesting about this is I find when I talk to people that they automatically assume I'm saying he's not as bad as fascism. Uh, and that's quite wrong. Um, you know, the, the Franco regime was far more brutal and repressive than Mussolini's regime in Italy. Far more. Uh, they um, killed uh, thousands of people, tortured thousands of people, kept thousands of people in, uh, in um, prison for very long periods um, after the Civil War, and after the Civil War meant during the Second World War, which meant that um, Western media had other things to pay attention to, so this uh, horrible carnage that was going on in Spain wasn't widely reported. Uh, so th that's an example uh, of the way people's minds work. They think if it's fascist, it's very, very bad. If it's not fascist, it must be better than, than, uh, than fascist. But that, that, I think that shows that the term is losing a lot of precision, losing a lot of usefulness, because it just means uh, Boo, we don't like this. Um, so, um, uh, so that's that's one thing about the way people use the word fascist. Now, um, new books come out on fascism, I suppose, every year or two. Uh, and I've read a lot of these books. Um, and one of the things that 90% uh, of them, they, have, they follow the same pattern. They always begin by saying, uh, Fascism is a very difficult thing to determine, to, to, to define. Um, uh, and they go on to give some of the difficulties, and then they come up with a list of characteristics. Uh, and each one, each new book that does this is a different list, slightly different list. So they don't go back and say, oh, Smith wrote about this in 1960, and I'm going to accept his. In other words, none of these lists ever catch on. They're, they've all got their different uh, ways of identifying fascism, and, and this suggests that, um, you know, again, that it's not a very useful concept. Um, I'm, I'm, I like science, and one of the things about science is that it comes up with a simple formula that will explain a lot. So, I, when I'm looking at some topic, I'm always trying to come up with that simple formula that will explain a lot. So I did have this brainwave at one point. I thought, this might be the way to define fascism. Um, and that is uh, all those movements that use the Roman salute. Uh, the Roman salute uh, is um, to extend the right arm. I'm not going to demonstrate it because uh, you know what can be done with videos these days. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, um, but the, so the Roman salute. So I thought, well, that could be it because. Uh, Mussolini's movement used the Roman salute. Hitler's movement used, used they didn't call it the Roman salute. Uh, they called it the German salute. <laughs> the, the, actually, the, uh, the Hitler Gruss uh, was what they called it. But um, uh, so I looked into the history of this, and uh, guess what I found? Uh, the the rehab. The, First of all, the Romans didn't use the Roman salute. There's no evidence the Romans ever used the Roman salute. Uh, but this, this form of salute was introduced by Francis Bellamy when he um, wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. And it was, it was a United States thing. Uh, and it goes with the Pledge of Allegiance. So you're supposed to extend your right arm with the palm down. Uh, and um, this is what millions of Americans did for many years, from 1892 when it started up until the 1940s, when they decided to change it and put the hand on the, actually they put, there was a period where they had the hand on the heart and then uh, the Bellamy salute, and then they cut out the Bellamy salute altogether. Uh, so uh, uh, you, could, you could sometimes embarrass people by finding old photographs of them uh, doing this salute, 
Uh, it's the Bellamy salute. Uh, so that's the origin of it in modern times, and maybe the origin of it altogether in history. Um, so um, the, as far as we know, the Romans didn't use the Roman salute, but it was, uh, it was um, shown in a very popular painting of the Roman world by uh, Jacques-Louis David uh, in 1784. Uh, and you, it's it's um, uh, the oath of the Horatii. So you see these three uh, people who are going to defend Rome against the other city that they're fighting, uh, raising their arms. And this, from there, it was copied into various stage plays, uh, and then it was copied into um, <clears throat> into movies, which of course began around that time in the 1890s. Uh, so this, this, this propagated the idea that. Um, uh, Romans used to say, hail Caesar, and give the Roman salute. Well, they didn't give the Roman salute. On very rare occasions, people did say, Ave Caesar, uh, meaning hail Caesar, uh, but, um, uh, not, but very rarely. Um, so uh, so th 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 there we go. So you, uh, it was homegrown in the United States, and it led to uh, you saluto Romano or der Hitler Bruce. So that's, that's where it came from came from the US of A. So uh, now I'll, I'll say a bit about the history of what we call fascism. Um, there was a man named Benito Mussolini. Uh, he was born in 1883, the, day, the, the year that Karl Marx died. Um, and um, he was raised a militant left-wing socialist, um, and um, he remained a, a militant left-wing socialist for many years. Uh, he was a Marxist and syndicalist uh, sympathies. Um, so he eventually became one of the leading members of the Socialist Party of Italy. This was in the, this was back in the, the time of the First World War. Um, so there was no Communist Party yet, because the Communist movement hadn't split from the Socialist movement, which they did in 1919, and called upon their members to oppose the, uh, the, the, the non-Communist Socialists, and in fact called them Social Fascists. Um, so um, Mussolini was, was uh, a leader of the, of the, the, the preeminent leader really of the Socialist Party, and it, a lot of people thought he would be a future uh, Italian head of state, either a revolutionary, like a, like a Lenin-type revolutionary, or through through parliamentary elections. And uh, he was very erudite. He read Marx. He read all these uh, people. He um, contributed to Marxist discussions. He was a, uh, a full-blown Marxist with syndicalist uh, sympathies. Now, when what we now call the First World War started in August 1914. Um, Italy was neutral and remained neutral for a while, um, and the the, um, the Socialist Party in Italy uh, very much supported this neutrality. They thought it was a terrible thing. Uh, basically, the, the Marxist idea that the workers have no country and you shouldn't fight for imperialism. Uh, so, uh, and then Mussolini startled everybody. Uh, in early 1915 by switching and becoming a pro-war, yeah, saying that Italy should uh, join the war in support of the Allies against the Central Powers. Um, and so he, was, he had become editor of the leading, uh, the official Socialist Party journal, Avanti, uh, and he was expelled, he was removed from that position, he was expelled from the Socialist Party. Uh, he joined up and fought in, in the um, in the First World War uh, against the Austrians. Um, and um, so after the war, uh, uh, he, he was invalided out because of a, a, a mortar ex uh, accident explosion uh, injured him. So he was, uh, see, he was, so he was w wounded in the war, but not in the, li not in the front line, but it, it, due to an accident. So it's not quite so glamorous. Um, <coughs> So Mussolini, uh, up until he became pro-war, had been the darling of the of the um, of the hard left. He was the Che Guevara of his day, uh, but then he became uh, pro-war and he became uh, cast into outer darkness by the Socialist Party. So by the end of the war, he 
he, he was a well-known figure because he'd been the leader of the Socialist Party uh, and their chief writer and speaker. Uh, but he didn't have an organized movement, and he formed this, uh, this uh, organization, uh, which called itself Fasci, meaning uh, Fascio is an Italian word just meaning a group or league, uh, and the plural is Fasci, so uh, he formed this group called the Fasci, uh, and they, um, they started putting forward policies, and it was very difficult immediately when they started in 1919 to tell what they were, because they had a lot of left-wing ideas, uh, it seemed. Uh, and, but, but they had this nationalist, pro-militarist, pro-nationalist um, uh, kind of strain as well, which was uh, very much not in harmony with traditional leftism at the time. So, um, after, in Italy, after the First World War, there was a lot of uh, violence and breakdown, uh, violent strikes, violent confrontations, people being attacked by leftist groups uh, and um, uh, in, so in, into this kind of welter of violence uh, there was this new organization of uh, called themselves fascists uh, and, and they quickly developed uh, a kind of thuggish militia called the black shirt the squadry actually but they wore black shirts so they became known as the black shirts um, and they had, uh, it's inter this, the intellectual evolution of Mussolini is very interesting. Uh, but he had become convinced, like many other syndicalists, uh, that there was going to be no socialism in the advanced countries like Germany, Britain, France, the United States. Uh, and, so, and socialism had, given that there was going to be no socialist revolution, in these countries. Uh, socialism had nothing to offer a comparatively backward country like Italy, which needed to industrialize rapidly. Uh, so this was his rationale for becoming nationalistic. Um, and uh, this was the way a lot of syndicalists were thinking. It was a, it was a, a definite uh, stream of thought called national syndicalism. Uh, and <clears throat> Excuse us. Go ahead, right there. Yeah. Having decided that, he, de he decided that what was what was good for Italy ice, was ice industrial development, no, uh, and the activities no of no the ice. left uh, were a hindrance to this economic development. So uh, the the black shirts began to um, break up strikes and other and break up violent demonstrations. In other in other words, they started to attack the left, which was already doing violent stuff. Uh, but the, the black shirts decided to attack them. And so you got this increasing civil disorder, but you had the feeling, a lot of Italians had the feeling, that the black shirts were trying to bring some order into the situation. They were trying to prevent uh, these, uh, these demonstrations and violent outbursts getting out of hand. Uh, so it got worse and worse, uh, and there was talk of civil war. Uh, and the black shirts decided to have a march on Rome. Uh, they, they had had marches on cities, and they put down strikes and things like that. Um, but this was a big deal. They were going to march on Rome and take over the government. Uh, and <clears throat> there's evidence that Mussolini was dragged along by the black shirts. The black shirts were uh, the squadron. They were local autonomous uh, groups. Uh, with um, with a lot of independence, and, and they uh, at this uh, in 1919 and 1920, Sorry. Mussolini was hoping to do an alliance with the communists and get a large portion of the left into the fascist movement. But they, the black shirts didn't like this, uh, and they started to say that if this happened, they would expel Mussolini, even though he was obviously the most prominent figure in the fascist movement. They would expel him. Now. <clears throat> In the middle of all this, the king of Italy was persuaded to offer Mussolini the prime ministership. And so that's what happened in 1922, perfectly legally uh, under the Italian constitution at the time. Uh, 
Mussolini was made prime minister, the youngest prime minister ever in uh, Italian history, uh, uh, and by the, the king begged him to become prime minister, uh, and that's what they so he said after a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of beating about the bush. He said he graciously said yes, uh, and so when Mussolini took power in Italy in, uh, in um, 1922. For a while, it was still a constitutional system. In other words, Mussolini didn't immediately become a dictator. This took a, this took a few years. Uh, John, hold so, on, hold on. You're, you're, we, uh, you're blocking. You're blocking the. Sorry about that. Wait. You're glad, David. Sorry. So, between 1922 and 1926, uh, Italy gradually in stages um, took on more and more the pattern of a dictatorship. By 1926 you can say Mussolini was definitely a dictator, although he never, he, he always had to watch out, it was, it was never a total dictatorship like in, later came along in Germany. Um, it, it, he was always subject to various pressures, it was always a matter of fancy footwork. Now Mussolini um, at this time in the, in the uh, 20s and early 30s, um, was a glamorous figure, and it's difficult now to understand how uh, much admired he was throughout the world. Um, and um, Excuse me? I'll give a few examples. Um, there, was, um, there was the uh, Cole Porter song, You're the Top, You're the Great Houdini, You're the Top, You're Mussolini. Uh -huh. That was changed a couple of years later. Uh, there were uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, sent Mussolini one of his books and autographed it to the hero of culture um, uh, because Sigmund Freud and Mussolini both were amateur archaeologists who believed in collect who was, their hobby was collecting ancient art artifacts so they saw eye to eye on a lot of issues. Um, now, in July 1933, um, something happened. Does anybody know what happened in July 1933? No, well what happened was that um, a huge crowd gathered. Stalin met with Hitler in 1933? What? Stalin met with Hitler in 1933? No, no, no they, they didn't meet. Stalin certainly didn't meet with Hitler until much later. But no, um, what happened in 1933 was that uh, a large crowd gathered um, around... Uh, around Navy Pier in Chicago and they waited for hours because they knew that the Atlantici were arriving and this was the fascist armada of, of planes that had flown from Rome to Chicago uh, under the leadership of a man called Italo Balbo who was um, yeah. The second most prominent fascist after Mussolini, I would say. Um, and so, um, you have to remember in those days, uh, a long aerial flight was a very brave thing to, to embark upon. Uh, there were many people who did it for publicity, for, to write books because they were interested in flights or whatever. Uh, and the majority of these long aerial flights uh, were unsuccessful. And in most cases where they, were, where they were unsuccessful, there was loss of life. So it was very much like um, space travel is today. Uh, was, uh, now, what Balbo did was, and Balbo was a leading fascist, he was also an aviator, pioneer aviator. Um, what Balbo did was, um, he didn't just have one plane, he had 25 planes. And they flew from Rome to Chicago. Um, and this was the World's Fair, and it was the World's Fair on the 100th anniversary of Chicago's incorporation as a city right, in 1833. So um, uh, they arrived, um, and they were greeted to rapturous applause. They were they were regarded as great celebrities, uh, and. Um, 
So what happened was that um, uh, all kinds of honours were bestowed upon Balbo as a, and in full recognition that he was a representative of fascist Italy. Uh, so 7th Street became Balbo Avenue. Uh, that's just south of the loop. Um, uh, the, uh, the Columbus, the Columbus Monument um, uh, had added to it the inscription this monument has seen the glory of the wings of Italy led by Italo Balbo, July 15th, 1933. So, um, Balbo was given an honorary degree yeah, by the University. Yeah, he just sat down two seconds ago. Um, he was also made an honorary yes. member of the Sioux tribe. So, uh, the chief of the Sioux came and put a feathered headdress on Balbo's head. Um, <coughs> After, after he finished in Chicago, he was in Chicago for quite some time, uh, went to a huge meeting uh, which he addressed on Soldier Field. Uh, then the, this whole armada of 25 planes uh, flew to New York. They had a ticker tape parade. Uh, they went to Washington. They, uh, Balbo and his, uh, a few of his leading aviators had lunch with President Roosevelt. Roosevelt said how impressed he was and how much he admired the achievements of Italy under fascism, um, and um, so generally, you know, he was treated as a great celebrity. There were a few, pe few people who formed anti-fascist uh, demonstrations and things, but there were very few. Uh, generally speaking, uh, um, fascism was, um, was, was not considered a highly unpleasant uh, subject at the time. So. <coughs> Sir, you just sat down. I'll get you water. Uh, in 1933, uh, you know, Hitler became, while this was all going on, Hitler became Chancellor in Germany. Um, Hitler was Chancellor, and he also moved from being a constitutional appointed figure to being a dictator, but he did it much quicker than Mussolini. Uh, he did just took a few, a few, a few months uh, to become the uh, more or less absolute dictator. And he had, when he did become absolute dictator, he had more actual power than well, Mussolini did in Italy. Yeah. Um, so, there you've got, um, you've got fascism, a very glamorous movement. People had difficulty deciding whether it was right wing or left wing. Uh, a lot of people in the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, thought it was a good uh, example which we ought to follow. Uh, and then you had the, the rise of National Socialism in Germany, which the left called fascism, and lots of other people started calling fascism as well. So, if we're going to call both of these uh, organizations and movements fascist, where the question is, why are we doing that, and what are the similarities and differences? differences. Well, there certainly are many similarities between the Mussolini movement and the Hitler movement. No question about it. Um, so let me just run through some of the similarities first. Uh, both Mussolini and Hitler achieved power legally at first. Or, although they both tended to describe what they'd done as a revolutionary capture of power. In fact, it was done by political wheeling and dealing. Um, they, they both emerged as mass movements within a fundamentally liberal democratic system, uh, yet neither of them got a clear majority in a fully free election. Um, and in fact, Hitler, when he was uh, made chancellor, his recent showing in an election had marked a decline over the previous election. So everybody, a lot of people were saying, oh, that's the end of Hitler. We've seen the last of him. Um, but uh, that, that, of course, was not to be the case. Why he hated the Jews? Um, I'll tell you uh, why he hated the Jews. And uh, I'll answer any other question, because I know everything uh, later. Um, <laughs> oh, boy, Dave. Yeah. So, um, Having got into office, they both manipulated the system to outlaw all dissidents uh, and move towards a dictatorship. So um, they both had, a, they both had, prior to taking power, uh, a mass organisation which included a militia, uh, yes, uh, black shirts, all the stormtroopers. Hold off, Dave. Just wait till Heather's finished there, if you don't mind. 
<laughs> Sorry, I can't because I no, gotta I know, stand I there while he reads. It's okay, go ahead. Uh, so, so both the fascists and the National Socialists have this uh, militia, this this uniformed uh, uh, body uh, of fighters. And what that meant, of course, was that um, they had a mass movement and they had some fighters. So they had a state within a state before they... So when you asked Hitler to become chancellor, it wasn't just like asking somebody else to become chancellor, because Hitler becoming chancellor meant that you had all these stormtroopers uh, all over the place at every street corner uh, intimidating people. Uh, and um, it's rather similar with the black shirts uh, in Italy. Uh, so, the, so they were e easily able, because of this, to convert what had been a democratic state into uh, a dicta dictatorial state. Matzo ball, sweet, sour cabbage, cream of spinach. So, um, both movements uh, had a rhetoric of nationalism uh, and of national rebirth. Um, uh, both movements, both fascism and national socialism, uh, displayed resentment of the fact that the world had been carved up by the older, more established powers like Britain and France, uh, and they, they had come late into the game. And so Britain and France had grabbed all the colonies uh, and uh, had rigged the world against the poorer countries like Germany and, and Italy. Um, both movements had a rhetoric of action. They, they were obsessed with the idea of action as opposed to talk. Uh, and so if you're impatient with gridlock in government, then and someone says, oh, if only there was a way to cut through this and get something done, right. then you're, you're a kind of a potential fascist or Nazi voter. You'll vote for them and you'll start supporting them because that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of impatience that they would appeal to. Um, both movements, of course, glorified their leader, uh, the Duce and the Fuhrer. Oh, okay. uh, both and now, um, the last point I want to make, and this is something where a lot of people don't completely misunderstand these movements. Uh, both movements were modernizing movements. They were obsessed with modernization. They were obsessed with high tech, as we would say. Uh, they, in, it's absolutely false to think that Mussolini or Hitler wanted to go back to a bygone age. Uh, absolutely false. Uh, they both wanted to create something completely new, uh, something that had never existed in history. Uh, and uh, now, they would sometimes use appeals to the nation's former glory, but this was marketing, this was propaganda. Mm. This was part of their, uh, part of the game they played. Uh, their, their, con their convictions are very clear. Uh, they were, uh, and it's symbolized in a way by Balbo and his, and his, um, and his aeronauts. Uh, this, this, the, they were in love with new, fast, big technology. Um, so, so those are some similarities between the fascists and the Nazis. Um, now, if we want to look at um, differences, what are the differences that, that would strike you? Well. From the beginning, the Nazis were obsessed with race, uh, especially the issue of anti-Semitism, whereas fascism paid no attention whatsoever to race. Um, and um, in fact, um, there were, the, the, in fact, the fascist movement had uh, had a, a, a very high number of Jewish members who rose to high positions in the fascist party. Um, Mussolini uh, had um, a Jewish mistress, and this was very well known, and she was re referred to in the press and so on as the un uncrowned queen of Israel. Um, uh, later, when uh, in 1938, when uh, when Hitler and Mussolini formed their pact, uh, part of the deal was that anti-Semitic measures be introduced into Italy. But up until then, there had been absolutely nothing. Um, now you want and um, so that's a big difference. Uh, in fact, not only that, but um, uh, in that period before 1938, uh, Mussolini often ridiculed Nazi racial theories, uh, said how 
uh, completely idiotic it was to believe in this uh, in this idea of, uh, of racism. But um, he changed his tune in 1938 in order to have this alliance with Hitler. Um, another difference is the Nazis proclaimed themselves to be socialists, whereas the fascists proclaim themselves to be a middle way or third way between liberal capitalism and socialism. So um, there's a difference in rhetoric, but it's also a difference in, um, in economic philosophy. The, the Nazis were far more likely to nationalize factories and, and build new state factories than the, than the fascists. Um, the fascists uh, eventually came to accept the, the, the theory known as the corporate state. A lot of people misunderstand this. The word corporate in corporate state has nothing whatsoever to do with business corporations. That's not what it means. What it means is that they had the idea, and this, was, this came from syndicalism, uh, that there is something artificial about dividing people up into geographical territories and letting them vote within a territory to choose uh, a representative. But it was much, much more natural and in keeping with sort of organic view of society to have the representatives of different occupational groups and the interest groups um, elect people. And then the state would be at the top uh, sort of umpiring for these different interest groups. So that's the idea of a corporate state. Um, uh, the other big difference, of course, as I mentioned, was that the, um, the fascist regime was far less unitary and less thorough in imposing its system than national socialism. Uh, Mussolini always had to wheel and deal with various interest groups, including within his own ranks, his own followers. <coughs> now, you know, in, between 1933, when Hitler came to power, uh, and 1939, there was no assumption in, um, in the world, people who wrote about politics, they certainly made no assumption that Germany and Italy would be on the same side. Even though the left was saying these are both fascists, and of course by this time there were, lots, there were dozens of other fascist movements all over Europe um, called fascists by the left, although in most cases didn't call themselves fascists. Um, in 1934, uh, at that time, 1934, Germany and Austria are still separate countries. Uh, but there is an, a Nazi movement, a national socialist movement, in Austria. Um, and the, the, the Austrian Nazis planned the coup. They wanted to take over Austria to unite it with Germany. Uh, and they killed the leader of the Austrian head of State, Dolphus, Engelbert Dolphus. Uh, and um, it looked as though the coup might succeed. Hit, uh, Mussolini rushed troops to the Austrian border. Um, and actually, some of these troops killed Austrian Nazis, and there were actually armed clashes. Um, and he proclaimed that, uh, that uh, uh, he would never allow Austria to unite with Germany. Uh, the Austrian independence was dear to his heart. Did um, I bring your food? And um, uh, so You're Hitler was a bit club. surprised uh, by all this. With cottage um, cheese. And announced that he had no control over the Austrian Nazis and they'd done what they'd done without his permission. And it was a great sad loss that Dolphus had been killed. Um, and he deeply regretted it. Um, so uh, those who had organized the coup in Austria, were expelled from the Nazi party in Austria. Um, and um, various things attended this. For example, in one Italian city, there was a big statue in a public square of a historical figure who happened to be German. And Mussolini ordered this to be torn down. And he replaced it with uh, a statue of the Roman, ancient Roman general who had conquered a lot of Germanic lands. Uh, so, um, so people all over Europe said, well, this is, this is Mussolini is the man who can stand up to Hitler. Uh, and, you know, this is, and, and furthermore, if someone stands up to Hitler, Hitler will back down and apologize. Uh, so that was, that was the conclusion that people had in 1934. So it wasn't fated uh, from the beginning that um, Germany and, and Italy uh, would um, would unite if there was ever any armed conflict. 
uh, you know, would, would have seemed just as likely, perhaps more likely, to someone in Britain or France looking at the situation, that Italy would do what they'd done in the First World War and side with the Allies uh, against Germany. Uh, so, so that was, you know, the, the later things changed, and part of the part of the uh, deal that, that Hitler did with Mussolini was that the, the South Tyrol, which had for long long been part of Austria, the Austrian Empire, but had um, a, a substantial Italian population, uh, Hitler solemnly and publicly declared that this was, would always be part of Italy and that the, the Reich had no claim upon it. Uh, so that was part of the deal. So, I'll say a couple of things about the Spanish Civil War. Um, the Spanish Civil War went from 1936 to 1939. There were two sides, the Nationalists and the Republicans. Uh, both sides were a coalition of different uh, elements, different movements. So on the nationalist side, there were monarchists, there were, there were phalang phalangistas, who were basically um, fascists, there were Carlists, who were very conservative-minded uh, traditionalists, there were generic conservatives, there were Catholics, who didn't much appreciate the way the left was sort of uh, raping and, and killing uh, nuns and, and priests and burning churches, they, they didn't appreciate that, so they tended to support the nationalist side. Um, on the Republican side, there were li li liberal Republicans, there were socialists, there were communists, there were anarchists, um, and um, as we know from the life of George Orwell, there was also the POUM, uh, the Pomistas in, in Barcelona, a, a small anti-Stalinist Marxist group. Um, the, the, the Spanish Civil War at first, at first uh, General Franco proclaimed, that, uh, proclaimed a coup, or pronunciamento, uh, and, uh, and everybody thought, well, it would go one way or the other. Spain will, either the republic, the, the, the democratic republic, will squash this rebellion, or the coup will succeed. But what actually happened was that Spain was divided into two territories, one half controlled by the Republicans, the other half controlled by the Nationalists, and they fought uh, from 1936 to 1939, and gradually the Nationalists kept winning. Whenever, the, whenever there was a change in the front, it was to the Nationalists' benefit, and they, and they eventually uh, took over. So, um, and that led to the, the uh, complete dictatorship of General Franco uh, until his death, his lifelong dictatorship. About five and, minutes, that, and that was something that, uh, that, um, that no supporter of the nationalists would have preferred in 1936. Right? So this is what happens when you get something uh, on this scale. Uh, it, it tends to go in a direction that nobody really wants. Um, so the, the fascist element in uh, the nationalist side is called the Falange, uh, and um, they were a fairly small part, but very dedicated, very enthusiastic, very militant. Um, and uh, they, they called themselves the, the Falange Española, Spanish Phalanx. Um, uh, and the whole group of nationalist uh, organizations, which, which had very different ideological uh, features. Uh, they were united into a new party by Franco, uh, which became the one party in the one party state of France. Uh, and they borrowed the word phalange from the phalanges, but they're two completely different. The phalange that, uh, that um, was a fascist organization and a small part of the nationalist <coughs> movement is different from the phalange that was General Franco's party. Uh, and that actually gave as much weight to the Carlists uh, as it gave to the, uh, the, the, to the Falange. So, um, I, I, I was going to talk a little bit about why all this happened, <laughs> but probably I don't have long enough to, to go on that. So I'll just say a few things about um, lessons for today, as you might say. Um, uh, we don't want, most people uh, don't want the system of liberal democracy to be replaced 
by a system of authoritarian one-party rule, and I'm fully in agreement with that. I much prefer a system of liberal democracy to uh, a dictatorship. Um, and um, so I'd like to say a little bit about this. One thing is this. Uh, you don't have, uh, you never see uh, in Europe when all these things, all these dictatorships were emerging. Many of the dictatorships which emerged in Europe, uh, you think, oh, one democracy after another is falling to dictatorship. And that's true in a sense. On the other hand, many of, the, many of these were new countries that had been created in 1919 at the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and so they didn't have a long historical existence as countries in, like Yugoslavia uh, um, or Czechoslovakia, you know. Um, they, they, they were new countries, um, although Czechoslovakia never went dictatorial, but, um, but, but no, except because it was conquered. Uh, but what happened, so, so that's the first thing. A lot of these, a lot of these countries, the, the democracy had very, very frail roots to start with. Uh, but the other thing is, in those countries like Italy and Germany, where you, where you can see um, the democratic process throws up this movement, which then manages to get power, you don't have a healthy, vibrant democracy which suddenly gets, gets taken over by a dictator. That never happens. That's never happened in history, um, except in terms of foreign conquest. But from within the country, that's never happened. In other words, before Hitler took power, there were stages in which the Weimar Constitution was weakened and, and uh, uh, twisted uh, uh, because of the, the particular people who were in power at the time. And the same thing in, in Italy. Uh, it, it was a process by which groups were persuaded that they'd better do this and this and this. And it led by a process of the weak, that they weakened and uh, undermined democracy and undermined the constitution um, and this happened over several years so you know this before Hitler took power and before Mussolini seized power or in Mussolini's case for the first couple of years of his prime ministership uh, there is this process of weakening democracy uh, and so uh, so you, so the question then is we it's not we have a wonderful democracy uh, isn't it great uh, let Maybe tomorrow it will be overthrown by a dictator. Well, if it's overthrown by a dictator tomorrow, that means there was something wrong with it already. Uh, the other with the rut sets in before the dictator uh, takes over. Um, so, so I would say um, uh, my advice would be if you don't want to see a dictatorship. Uh, I don't think we're in any great danger of a dictatorship at the moment in the United States. Uh, but um, certainly certain steps have been taken uh, in, in pursuit of like, the war on terror and the war on drugs and uh, other, other things to weaken civil liberties and give tremendous power to the government. Um, and that could be part of a process that ultimately leads to a dictatorship if that's possible. I wouldn't rule it out, but it's not going to happen in the next few years. Um, I would say don't attack liberal, demo liberal capitalist democracy because it looks bad by comparison with some totally impossible system. Um, don't do that. Uh, if, if, you, if you like democracy, defend democracy, uh, and including some of the, the attributes of democracy, which are um, gridlock, for example, is an attribute of democracy. The, the framers of the US Constitution wanted gridlock. That's what they wanted. They wanted to, they wanted one part of government to frustrate another part. Ambition to counteract ambition, uh, because they saw what a powerful in instrument the coercive state was, and they wanted to um, reduce its force by, uh, by having the separation of powers. That's part of, um, part of democracy. Um, don't listen to people who say, this particular problem is so urgent that all our normal constitutional measures should be overthrown. So whether it's the war on drugs, uh, the war on terror, climate change, uh, these are such, so, so serious that we need, we need to cut through democracy and do well, something uh, that uh, erodes democracy. One pull at a time. Uh, One pull at a time. Yeah. Uh, right. One pull at a time. All right, 10 years left. Don't. One pull at a time. That's all.
Don't fall for that line of reason. That would be one fall at a time. Just one. Oh, there's Justin. All right, all right. Uh, order, please. Let's conclude, Dave, and get right to the question and answer period. Right. I think you're okay. getting your stuff going pretty good, though. Right. When you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready to take questions. Yeah. First all one. Right. All right. Let's thank, thank our speaker. Um, <laughs> all, right. Sure. all right, the first question from me is, with the election of Donald J. Trump as President of the United States and his proclivity towards getting a somewhat dictatorial regime and coming in here, uh, what state or part would you say that the U.S. is becoming more fascist? Or do you think we still have a good liberal system of checks and balances that may cancel out something like our our current president? Right. Can you give an example of the more dictatorial? Well, um, for maybe? example, his um, you know, he's been trying to pass certain things in Congress on immigration. Um, there's been a new book out about him about how he's disregarding advice from senior level managers. Uh, some of the shenanigans going on with the uh, Ukraine as well as some of his uh, past uh, emoluments going on that it's kind of skirting the law a little bit. I mean, we all know that Trump's kind of a, a shady character, you know, shorting vendors and a lot of other things, according to the book by uh, David K. Johnson. Uh, but do you, I just want to know, his influence is starting to pervade a little bit more as president. Uh, just comment on where we're at. I, I don't actually see any of those things. I, don't, I mean, I, I okay. don't see. Well, I mean, what I do see, what I do see right. is, um, first of all, um, uh, economic nationalism. Okay. Right? That's a feature of fascism. It's also a feature of Trumpism. Um, and um, uh, the idea that uh, international relations is a zero-sum game, that if we, if we gain, then other countries have to lose. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, um, so. So those are those are definitely um, uh, com in common between Trumpism and fascism. I don't see that Trumpism has, has made the U.S. constitute or made the U.S. polity more dictatorial. I just don't see that. I mean, uh, every time there's a court decision, Trump abides by it, um, uh, disregarding the advice of this or that. Nobody, it doesn't count for anything. That's, okay. uh, that's what you're entitled to do if you've been elected. <laughs> so okay. um, so uh, I, I don't see that as, um, as being anything to do okay. with uh, uh, a, a, a move away from democracy. So, I mean, I think that um, the, big, the big movements away from democracy in this country predated Trump. I would say the, um, the, uh, the RICO, uh, the Patriot Act. Uh, things like that were, were uh, uh, definitely anything that cuts down uh, on civil liberties. Um, okay. I mean, I don't think the Trump the Trump administration has um, a terrific record on civil liberties. I mean, the um, uh, the decision to prosecute um, Julian Assange, for example, okay. I think is a, a serious uh, threat to the press. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the press doesn't recognize that, and they're, they're, they're glad to see uh, the government go after the sign. But that was one point where Obama had it right and Trump had it wrong. Um, All right. As a point, can we get our answers a little more brief to get a lot more questions in, if you don't mind? All right, this guy next, and then we'll go to Don. All right. All right. Uh, is National Socialism real socialism, in your opinion? Well... If there's one thing I'm an expert on, it's the meaning of the word socialism. Uh, and I can talk at great length about the various meanings it's had. Um, put it this way, um, Ludwig von Mises put forward the idea that what you have in Russia, he's talking about from the 1920s on, the 30s, 40s, uh, what you have in Russia, he called the Russian model of socialism, and what you have in Nazi Germany, he called the German model of socialism. Here you go. And the point he was getting at was that uh, you, could have, you can have nominally private ownership of resources, but it's so regulated 
uh, and the prices are and output and so on are so regulated that in fact it's not functioning like a, a market system. As, although it's got some of the benefits of the market system, basically it's very distorted by this government uh, regulation. Uh, so I, I think that's right. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, the way people use the word socialism is terribly confused. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I always think of Bernie Sanders saying in 2015 that what he wanted to see was something like Denmark. Well, the, the socio-political structure of Denmark is about as close as you can get to identical to the socio-political system of the United States, <laughs> but they're identical systems. And I would call them uh, welfare state capitalism. Uh, I wouldn't call them socialism. Uh, but, th but of course, in certain, in certain subcultures and certain traditions, people call that socialism. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, the other thing is, you have to distinguish between things that were done during the war as a matter of emergency and might have been lifted. Uh, and also the long-term evolution. I think there's no doubt at all that, um, that this, the, the National Socialist regime in Germany was becoming more and more like the Soviet Union as time went on. But of course it only lasted a few years. Okay, it was then uh, defeated and put out of existence. So we don't know what would have happened if okay. it had another 50 years of the Soviet Union. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, Jay, how is Barack Obama's um, how's, how's Barack Obama supposed to Julian Assange different from Donald Trump? Oh, he didn't. He didn't want the government to prosecute Julian Assange, <coughs> and they, so they didn't. But the, but now I don't know if Trump paid much attention to it. But the Justice Department is going after Julian Assange, and they of course they got him out of um, the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, they extradited him successfully. So um, I would say he should be given a medal. Lana is next. Go ahead, Lana. Okay. Thank you. I have very quick two questions, if I may. Uh, which wing Hitler was, right wing or left wing? Oh. This first question and the second, please. Uh, when Stalin met with Hitler, right? After a couple of years, World War II started. What, do you know what they were talking about? I mean, it's because there's many speculation, you know, in internet. I'm not sure what the second question is. Uh, let me say the first, uh, right wing and left wing is very, very treacherous terminology. It was changed a lot. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if, um, if uh, for instance, if, uh, if, if right wing means uh, less state control, then uh, Hitler would have been um, to the right of but he was Soviet socialist. Russia. He was proclaiming socialism and communism, right, Hitler, or no? No. No? Okay. He, he you know, All right, he next. Uh, All right. Socialism and communism? You and then Travis, okay? Yeah, is nationalism confused yeah. many times with fascism? Okay. So what was yeah, it? it? All, <laughs> nationalism is confused with fascism. Yes. Right, nationalism isn't necessarily fascist, right? No, it, it's, been, it's been used a lot of times right, confused right. with fascism. That's why I, say, I think Trump is a nationalist, and there are some aspects of his nationalism I really don't like, but I don't think Trump is a fascist. <coughs> yeah. Okay, Mr. Travis. Uh, yes, um, according to Mike Wallace, the only thing Mussolini did for Italy was to make the trains run on time. However, according to Mario Puzo, in his book, The Godfather, Mussolini actually was successful in getting rid of the Mafia during his reign. Uh, in your opinion, did Mussolini do any good at all for Italy other than those two things? Oh, uh, I, I mean, I'm not terribly impressed by anything that Mussolini... I mean, Mussolini did a number of things which excited the admiration of the world, right? One thing he did was he drained the Pontine marshes, which people have been talking about for over 2,000 years. And, and so, okay, that's something he did. Uh, he, made a, uh, he made a settlement with the Vatican, so the, the whole relationship between the Vatican, which was still theoretically a political entity of state, uh, with Italy uh, was very much in flux, and he sorted out something, an, an arrangement that was that was um, 
accepted by the Vatican and accepted by him and has prevailed ever since. And it seems like a satisfactory solution. Uh, so I suppose you could say that was an achievement. Um, he, um, uh, I mean, the, the, making the trains run on time, I think I've heard two accounts of what, of what happened to make the trains run on time. One, one was that he smashed the socialist trade unions that were messing about with the rail service. So then the trains ran on time. That's one version. Another version is that he, he diverted resources uh, from the new little uh, upcoming railroad stations to the big glamorous ones that everybody could see. And so people could see improvement in, in Rome and, and Milan, but, they, but, but in the countryside, the, the rail service was going downhill. So, um, so, to speak. so uh, you know, so those, those are two versions I've heard. I'm Excuse not sure me, David, but uh, uh. may I ask, what are the Pantean marshes? Oh, the marshes outside Rome, where which were. Uh, they, uh, it's a centre from the was for centuries, thousands of years, a centre from malaria, and uh, it was a big undertaking to drain them and get that uh, get that um, sorted out, so that it wasn't a health hazard. The only oh, other thing. All right, I all right. To Come on. Go ahead, Dave. Excuse me. The only other thing no, I wish to You get like eight not questions not in a row. Why can't he? Not no, not. because I said so. That's why. Right. Badges. All right. Don't just shut up and go on the next. All right. Let's go with our next question. The, the U.S. Senate failed to ratify the Versailles Treaty. Was it after World War One? Was that because it was too extreme and too hard on Germany? No. 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 I think, well, I, look. Um, I've read what some historians have said about that, and uh, I don't, but I'm not, I'm not a historian of that period. Um, uh, what I've read suggests that um, Woodrow Wilson was much more interventionist in his outlook than most American politicians at that time, That's true. and they mostly wanted to have nothing to do with Europe. <laughs> uh, that was a, that was a popular sentiment, and it was a sentiment in the in the House and the Senate at the time. Um, and um, uh, you might say America first to come in a setting. Uh, so um, uh, I think that that was mainly. That but was do you think the treaty was too hard on Germany? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I do. All right. Next question, please. No, oh, I got a question. Um, I'm going to try to get around anybody who has. There's somebody yeah, behind yeah. you who has his hand up. Okay, Charlie. <coughs> yes, uh, David. In your opinion. Human activity has had no effect, apparently, on the on the earth. There is certainly nothing that we need to be concerned about, right? Go on, what's your? Well, is that your opinion? That human activity has had no effect. No, human upon activity has had all kinds of effects on the earth. On the earth. Oh. Or certainly nothing we should be concerned about. Oh, I'm concerned about the, pi the, the piling up of plastics in the oceans. To take That's one it. example, I mean it's not a, it's not as uh, crazy bad as people think it is because the plastics biodegrade and uh, disappear eventually. But um, uh, just like plant material does, but it is a, unsightly and aesthetically. Uh, to see, um, you know, plastic okay. cuts in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific. Well, our major concern is plastic. Okay. Well, that's one. That's one. But there are lots of other ways in which, um, okay. in which humans affect the environment. Next question. Go ahead. But one thing you can be sure of: a little increase in CO2 yeah. does not have a big effect on the whole environment. All right. So basically, you're saying a little increase in CO2 does not have that much effect, correct? Right. Okay, let's get our next questioner. Please. Okay, um, didn't Hitler do certain um, policies that were kind of, uh, le you know, left wing or social welfare kind of oriented? And what, what were some of those policies? Because I know he had some certain popularity due to policies. Well, that family allowances and things like that. He was a big welfare state. I mean, but that, that goes back in German history. Bismarck was, was a big welfare state as well, going back into the 19th century. So there is, there is this um, tradition in, Ger in Germany uh, that predates really the welfare states in the Anglo-Saxon countries of, of um, 
Uh, and it goes back, I suppose, to the, the point in, in German history where the big landowners and their political representatives saw that they had something in common with the socialists, and that was um, <clears throat> that, that was their dislike for what was called Smithismus and Manchester Tum. In other words, um, Adam Smith's ideas and the domination of Manchester. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, that, 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 it was quite natural that, um, that uh, a, national, a National Socialist Party would go for a big welfare state. Uh, would you say it was similar in some ways to our? Oh, well, in, in every way, yes. It was a welfare state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you, you uh, pay people to be unemployed, you pay people okay. to have children, uh, and so on. You pay people in sickness, uh, and so on. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, the, Next From the point of view of a, of a sort of welfare status, Hitler, Hitler was a successful. Next question, please. Go ahead, stand up if you don't mind. Um, despite the stuff about the national syndicalist roots of the Italian fascist movement, I know other scholars like uh, Eugene Weber, uh, Daniel Ziblatt, uh, Jeffrey Herf have emphasized that the reactionary social politics were a big part of this, the cultural politics of this. Um, and if you could comment on any of that, and also in more recent decades that up to today, the neo-fascist movements, especially in continental Europe. Well, um, the, I'm not sure what you mean by neo-fascist movements. I mean that... Um, yeah, you've got to define the term. I grew, I grew up in Britain, as you may have guessed, and um, there were little groups of, of, of people that you might reasonably call neo-fascists or neo-Nazis, neo if you more like, more uh, close. Um, but then they didn't um, they didn't achieve much success in, in elections. Um, so it's a, it's a small minority, just like it is here. Um, the, the, I think one of the intro, going back to this thing about the ideas of the fascists and so on. Um, of course, it's, it's obvious and it's a cliche, but um, uh, most academics are left-wing in outlook. Uh, and so they, they tend to um, uh, they tend to be more soft on the communists than on, on the Nazis, put it that way. Um, but there's something else that goes on, which I've noticed quite a lot, and it's and it's a more, more subtle aspect of this left-wing bias. And that is, when they talk about the communists, they tend to talk about the communist behavior and accomplishments in terms of the communist intentions. They look at what the communists were saying they were trying to do, and they look at it in that light. Whereas if they look at uh, Hitler or Mussolini, uh, especially Mussolini, who was a big intellectual, uh, had all kinds of ideas about uh, social dynamics, um, uh, they, look, they tend to ignore what Mussolini thought. Uh, I mean, there are a few exceptions. Gregor would be the big exception okay. in American, American academic. All right, Don, you have another question? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Dave, have you uh, read The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton? Yes, a long time. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Well, so what do you think of the book? Uh, it just blends into my mind with lots of other books. Oh. Okay. Do, you, do you think it's got some unique uh, insight? Well, normally, I don't like to give speeches when, when during the Q and A set. But since you asked, um, <laughs> I will uh, I will just say that there were some parts of the, that I, I got a lot out. I learned a lot from reading the book, and um, that there were obviously parts that uh, there were some parts of it that I disagreed with a little bit. But but I um, but but I yeah. So you I, can't I, identify something that it said that you think is a great insight. Okay. Um. What did I think was the insight about the book? Well, first of all, first of all, actually, I was going to talk about that in my rebuttal speech. All right, let's save it for the rebuttals. Anyway, okay. okay, we're going to take two more questions and go to rebuttals. Okay, what you got one over here? I got one here. Go ahead. Okay, uh, was uh, Japan a fascist state? And the other one, could you explain what Vichy France? What was their their thing? Okay. They were traitors, right? Well, um, I, I don't think that uh, Japan was a fascist state. Uh, 
I, I, think, I don't think there's any, I don't think they had any of the attributes. Well, they, had, they were nationalistic, so that's fascist. Uh, they were uh, militaristic, so you can say that's fascist. But in, you know, the political structure wasn't fascist. They, they, they weren't um, a mass movement. They weren't, um, uh, they, they don't have any of the attributes of uh, what you find in National Socialism or Italian fascism. Okay. So the Vichy regime, well, I mean, the point is Germany not, uh, had this big success in 1940 uh, and overran a large part of France, including Paris. Um, uh, and um, they, it wasn't in their interest to go to the expense of overrunning the whole of France. Yeah. So they left, they did a, a deal with the remaining part of France, and in, and, uh, <laughs> which was, had its headquarters in the town of Vichy. Um, and um, uh, the Vichy regime was. Uh, uh, headed by uh, like old soldiers like Marshal Pétain from the First World War, uh, tended to be quite right-wing in their thinking. They tended to uh, not be particularly fascist, but just very conservative, um, and um, wanted to get along with the Germans. Didn't want to, to bother the Germans. Uh, but wanted to survive. Uh, so uh, if they accommodated themselves to the reality that. The north of France was under German control, and they they were friendly, so they didn't have much option uh, if they didn't want to be okay. overrun. So, um, Janet, last question, please. Yeah, um, they did. They did, however, introduce anti-Semitic measures at the request of the Germans. Okay. Um, so, so they, you know, that that shows the, the lengths they were prepared to go to. Although, in many cases, it wasn't necessarily against their own sentiments, uh, but um, it shows that. It shows the lengths they were prepared to go to to placate the Germans. Okay, Janet, your last question. Uh, you talked about the difference between it, Italian fascism and Nazism. What about how was Spanish fascism different? Because that's, I sort of get the impression they were kind of fascist like. Well, my view is that, that there was this there was this, this, the Falange Española under. Um, originally under uh, Jose Antonio Primo de, de Rivera, was um, was a uh, was a clearly a fascist movement in every sense, uh, closely modelled on Mussolini's movement. Uh, but they never got preeminence. Uh, and when um, when Franco took over, I don't think that his regime can be characterised as fascist. Uh, partly because it did. It, wasn't a, it didn't start with a mass movement, it started with a military coup. Um, and um, that yeah, gave a completely different character. Although, I, although, it has to be said that Franco, uh, you know, politicians always want to be on the winning side. And there was this, uh, there was this tendency in the 30s for people to assume that, uh, that Germany was eventually going to be victorious. And so, um, they were prepared to go to some lengths to please the Germans. So, uh, when it, as long as it looked as though Germany was in the ascendant, um, Franco gave as much emphasis as he could in, in like the, the Roman salute, uh, all the all the other attributes, you know, the hefe that corresponds with Führer, and so on. Um, so that uh, uh, to make himself seem as um, much like the National Socialist regime, although he always resisted Hitler's um, attempts to get him to actually come into the war on Germany's side. Although, then again, Spain sent a lot of volunteers to whom, most of whom perished on the Eastern Front fighting for Germany. So, um, all right. That's, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but okay. tell us your book and how much is it? Uh, yes. Uh, can I? Get a copy and hold it up. Yes, please. Come on out. Can we borrow that for just a minute, please? The book is called The Mystery of Fascism, David Ramsey Steele's Greatest Hits. How much are they for? <laughs> well, it's, it, the list price is uh, $34. Is it available uh, on copy, Amazon? It's available on Amazon. The copies there are, I'm selling for $20, um, which is basically where I have to pay for them, uh, okay. uh, because I pay 60% of list plus shipping. Um, and that's close to $20. So uh, it's, a, it's a collection of essays on the, 
only about 5% of the book is about fascism. Oh, uh, um, So um, 23 different essays of articles, different lengths, different degrees of scholarly apparatus, and so on. Um, and I mentioned earlier what some of the topics I covered in this book. H, H U Art District writer. Let's thank David tonight for our round of applause. Let's uh, sit down and enjoy your dinner, and let's get a rebuttal started here. And we do thank you, David, for coming. I did hope I didn't mean to cut you off there, and I, you know you're all set. Okay, Don, we got to move on, please. Okay. You know, I, I know I got the back of your head quite a bit in my camera shot, so you know. Sorry. Well, uh, it's just you could have well. You shouldn't have a head. <laughs> well, no, it's just uh, we try to adjust a little bit, but uh, Don, you know, you're we're always welcome to come, and uh, oh, sometimes, well, sometimes I do get a little bit. Uh, uh, anyway, how many do want to rebut tonight? Uh, one, two, three, four. Probably say about uh, about what three to four minutes? You think? Twenty minutes each. One minute. Let's go about. Uh, Four minutes apiece. No, I'm sorry. Let me get three minutes apiece because we got. I'm sure we're going to have quite a bit. Um, let's line up over here for rebuttals. Dave, you always, as usual, get the last word. Uh, is somebody going to help me keep time tonight? Yeah. Give me. Give me. All right. Well, I'll just have to keep time myself then. All right. Let's get the rebuttal started and uh, let's thank one more rousing round of applause for for Dave. Timer going here. We're going to have to. I'm sorry, Dave. Let's get the first rebutter up there, please. All right. Thank you, sir. Rebutter, I like that. Um, uh, so the uh, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I, I don't want to disrespect anybody, but like, excuse me, if you come an hour late to listen to a speaker here at the College of Complexes, I think there should be a new rule. Please don't take the seat right up front next to the speaker's podium so that it has to be interrupting the speaker like three, four times as you know, they're taking orders and stuff. Like that, that was just distracting. Let's avoid that in the future. I, I would be happy about that. And then the only other thing I've got is I, 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 I was fortunate enough to be able to purchase a copy of this book previous to tonight. And uh, Dr. Steele was kind enough to sign it for me. Um, I read two chapters of it, and I have to say that, um, you know, I, I'm disappointed that I didn't purchase like 10 of these in order to give away. Um, but I would recommend uh, purchasing one of these. That's it. Okay. Our next rebutter, please. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Well, I got to answer that since he was talking about me. And so, uh, the, now. Uh, the reason I sat here is I, you know, I came here with Janet Miller. She's a very good friend of mine, and uh, and and uh, I now Janet's a, Janet is a disabled person, and, and 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 I so I drove. There were no handicapped spaces, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't I couldn't have parked in one anyway because I haven't got one of those uh, one of those rear, rear view mirror hang downs. So so I so I parked at the front door. I parked at the front door so she could come in, and then I went off and found a place to park in the parking lot. When I came, Janet had taken this seat, so I wanted to sit with her, so I, I sat at the only seat that, that was available at this table. Now, um, and, and, and frankly, you know, some people like to just complain and complain and complain about yeah. everything. And personally, yeah. you know, some people just have a problem with anything. And frankly, I have a problem with people like that. All right. Now, I did promise. I, I, did, mention, I did mention. I did mention that. Um, I did mention I was going to talk about Robert Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism. Uh, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it to everybody here. Uh, again, I do not agree with everybody. I want to say that there are some things that, and, and this is related. There are some things that that uh, Dave said that um, that are not true, which I, and, and first of all, first of all, uh, Dave said that the fascists in Italy took power legally. Uh, not exactly. Uh, I mean, they used a lot of strong arm, so-called strong arm tactics. They went in and they would beat up their political opponents, go into the union halls and beat up union members. You should like that, Charlie. Yeah. And uh, now that's, now if you, all of that stuff was illegal in Italy at the time they did it. Before, this was before they seized power. 
And, and, and if you read that, the hit Paxton's book, you'll see that they could not have come to power without doing it. But they gave the appearance of having to come to power legally. Okay, now, the second thing is the idea that fa Italian fascists paid no attention to race. I would agree that the Italian fascists were not anti-Semitic, but there are other kinds of racism besides anti-Semitism. The, the Italian fascists really hated Slavs, Arabs, and Ethiopians. And um, so the, the Slavs who lived in Italy, particularly in the city of Fiume, uh, came in for very bad treatment. Uh, the, the Italians were also very hard, the, the fascists were also very hard on the, uh, the Arabs in Libya, which at that time was an Italian colony. And they were absolutely merciless to the Ethiopians when they conquered that country. All right, now, um, finally, the idea that the fascists, um, and you, you can read about that in Paxton's book as well. Uh, the, the idea that fascists advertise themselves as a, mid, as a middle path between socialism and the right, uh, and, and that the Nazis did not do that. As a matter of fact, the Nazis did try to appeal to socialists uh, uh, when they were, before they took power, when they were trying to drum up support by saying, oh, we're, we're national socialists. And then when they talked to, to, to right-wing people, they would say, they would emphasize their nationalism. So they were doing the same thing. Um, now, on the subject of Vichy France, uh, the idea that Vichy France was conquered by Germany and therefore had no options but to surrender, um, I could tell you that the Dutch, the, the Belgians, the Norwegians, the Luxembourgers, the Czechs, and the Poles would strongly disagree because none of them surrendered. So that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Next, please. The Polacks didn't surrender? Oh. Nope, they never did. All right, let's, uh, Mr. Travis, when you're ready. I uh, uh, didn't get to finish my last part of my question, okay. but uh, I only wanted to make a joke anyway. I simply wanted to say that David Ramsey Steele has been caught red-handed. Will David Ramsey Steele please hold up his hands? I don't know what he's been caught in. He's caught red The other thing I have to say is far more serious. Okay. I greatly resent Charlie Paydock with his because no I say so. No personal no personal attacks. Attacks. No personal attacks. I'm not making a personal hey, attack, so if you'll shut up long enough hey, to hear what hey, I hey, say, hey, 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 then it would make a difference. Hey, 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 I greatly hey, resent hey, Charlie Paydock with hey, his hey, because no, I say so type thing. That smacks of Stalinism and and dictatorship. And that's that. Okay. But they shut off the plate. Boy, the right. what a communist conspiracy. Right. All right. <laughs> Let me, uh... Okay. We're getting the mic back on here real quick. I hope, uh... We're set with it. Okay. We'll turn it off in a minute. All right. Our next three butter, please. Mike, if you're ready. We're giving you three minutes thereabouts, and uh, let's keep going. All right, ready? Oh, if it takes another little, I, we can give you a little leeway on that. We'll go up to four. All right, ready? Okay. All right, a little bit of trivia here, first of all. Uh, it's ironic that Benito Mussolini was named Benito. He was that's not a common Italian name. He was named for Mexican revolutionary Benito Juarez, who uh, was uh, important on the left. Uh, one thing I dispute that uh, our speaker mentioned was uh, the importance of nationalism. All of these fascist Nazi movements, and they're all iterations of socialism, it is that uh, nationalism is an essential important aspect of their movements. The restoration of the past glory for the fascists that was based on ancient Rome, for the Nazis, the Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne, uh, for Putin, the Russian Empire. Note that he said that 
the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy. But he does, didn't want to restore the Soviet <laughs> Union. He wanted to restore the Russian Empire as it existed under the Tsars. Okay, this uh, idea of a corporate state that's based on the writings of Rousseau, who spoke of the orga organic state, that the state was an entity which should live above the population. Uh, that's an essential of both uh, fascism, Nazism, as well as Soviet communism. Uh, differences. There were differences in racial theories which the Italians didn't initially encounter. Economics uh, for fascist and Nazi movements, as long as the industrial owners were subservient to the wishes of the political powers. They were pretty much left alone. They had to fulfill their state contracts, whether it's weapons production or whatever. And then the difference is that the, uh, the Soviets and the Marxists insisted on ownership of the means of production. Uh, one interesting aspect about the, the Anschluss, when the uh, Nazis took over Austria, they uh, had what was called the Night of Long Knives, when they pretty much assassinated Austrian Nazis, including Dolphus, who was uh, a notorious homosexual. And those of you who follow my uh, posts know that uh, we have one who shows up here at the college occasionally. Okay, Spanish Civil War was got a minute. interesting. Now we have nothing to that. And uh, I'll just uh, one comment on one of the items on the liter literature uh, on Bernie Sanders' literature. It says, for the many, not the few, which is a, a direct adoption of Jeremy Corbyn's slogan only then, which turned out to be, for the many, not the Jew. So there is a certain degree of anti-Semitism, not only uh, from Corbyn, but also from Bernie Sanders. So he's a, a self-hating Jew. And, uh, People should be aware of him. I'm uh, notice that Charlie is wearing a button for uh, Tulsi Gabbard, so he's not a total idiot. And that's all I have to add. Thanks. Next rebutter, please. All right. All right, Dave, when you're ready. Yes, with regard to the World's Fair, um, that marked the year the incorporation of Chicago as a town in 1833, and not its later reincorporation as a city in 1837. Um, and it was held for two years in 1933 and 1934. Balboa and his pilots didn't land near Navy Pier. They landed for a little farther to the south uh, in what is now uh, Burnham Harbor. The exact spot across the street from the field, across Museum Campus Drive, from the Field Museum, where they came ashore, is marked by what's called the Balbo Column, which is a, a Roman column on a base without any other, uh, to the best of my knowledge, any other inscription or any other decoration to it. Um, with regard to the Knight of the Long Knives, that was not done against, uh, that was not done in Austria, that was done. Uh, in Germany, when Hitler yeah. put down the, the stormtroopers and the SA, and Ernst Röhm was a homosexual, or at least that was the excuse that Hitler gave. Uh, actually, he was doing it to placate the, Ver the leaders of the Wehrmacht, and or actually they called it the Reichswehr then, and he was using it to also to placate the others, the right-wing business people who helped put Hitler in power. They didn't want some dangerous, from their point of view private army running around in Nazi Germany, running around in Germany. Period, end of story. 
Um, with regard to Mussolini's takeover, I will say this. Um, one of the reasons why Mussolini was able to do this was because the king of Italy at that time, Vittorio Emmanuel, hey, Victor Emmanuel, was something of a weakling. He had been told, apparently, that a cousin of his was being backed by the fascists and would take his throne if he didn't agree to put, appoint Mussolini as the new president of the Council of Ministers, the new premier. Uh, and uh, what a more resolute king in Italy would have done, or what would have happened if the king of Italy had been more resolute and said, no, get out of here, I'm going to turn the army loose. Because the army was loyal to the king, not to Mussolini. Uh, who knows what would have happened then. Um, I agree with you that the fascists um, were repelled by most things that were old and were attracted by everything that was new. Like, for example, Hitler was told that if he wanted to avoid a transportation in the crisis, in the future he should build up the nation's railroads because they ran on coal, of which Germany had plenty. Germany had plenty. Hitler said no, and that's why the Autobahnen were built. Uh, the trouble is the Germans had plenty of coal and a lot less oil. That was, well, that was a constant problem for them during the Second World War. Um, okay. With regard to, um, to uh, Dolphus, uh, that most of what you said about him was correct. He was a short guy who was under four feet. There was once a powerful Austrian ruler named Marek. And Time magazine, which back then was perhaps a bit slanted, but more entertainingly written than it is now, entitled a column about him, Millimeter Neck. OK, all set? Yeah, I think so. All right, all right. thanks, David. Well, finally, before I go, Hang on. we must not forget about the role Hitler and Mussolini played in putting Franco in and in how big business was very supportive of Hitler and Mussolini. Thank you. All right. Next rebutter, please. Okay, go ahead. All right. We can see the sign. Um, uh, excellent talk, very interesting. Um, who here supports universal suffrage? Raise your hand. That's good. All right, a lot of people in the room here. Voting age at 18. Lots of folks. Formation of technical national councils for work, industry, transportation, social hygiene, communications. I think Charlie does, right? Yeah. Um, legally mandated eight hour workday. Who supports that in this room? A couple of you guys. Um, minimum wage. Who supports a minimum wage in this room? Well, a lot of you guys do. Participation of worker represent representatives in industry. Yeah. Wow, a lot of you guys, a lot of guys in this room do that. Um, <clears throat> entrusting proletarian organizations with management of industries and, yeah, and who supports that? More people. Yeah, people raise their hands. Uh, <clears throat> lowering old age insurance to 55 years of age. Who supports that? Lowering, lowering uh, old age insurance to 55. Some of you guys. Um, strong progressive tax on capital. Who supports that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Some of you guys do. Well, <clears throat> these are some of these are all planks from Il Manifesto de Fasci de Combatimento. So you guys are all a bunch of fascists. <laughs> Um, if we're going to use fascist, uh, fascist as an epithet, you guys hear about this Bernie staffer in Iowa, uh, 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 Kyle Jurek or whatever his name is? This guy's all about like throwing people in gulags and putting people against the wall and like there's going to be cities on fire if Bernie doesn't win. What's going to happen to Milwaukee? Milwaukee's going to burn according to this guy. Uh, so if we're going to use fascist as a person uh, in, in kind of the maybe the uh, over exaggerated sense of the word that maybe uh, this person would use, he is a fascist. Um, 
And I think that if, if people make commands and the rationale is because I said so, I think that's also indicative of fascistic tendencies as well. Um, I bought a copy of the book. I really dig the cover. I got to see that painting when I was in the Louvre. It was pretty sick. Um, I used, uh, when I did my Frederic Bastiat talk, I used it, uh, I think, uh, the 1830 uh, revolution. Um, yes, very excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, I'm also collecting uh, signatures, uh, calling for uh, to amend the Illinois Constitution. Fair maps. If you guys want to sign, uh, please do so. If you're a registered voter in Illinois, thank you. Jonathan. I'll tell you. I'll tell your petition half for you if you want. Do you want to? You want to sign it? No, but I'll, I'll take it. Are you sure? I'll take it and tear it up. Why? Okay. All right, let's, because I feel uh, like uh, it. I'm free to uh, All right, let's, uh, Jonathan, you're ready. Thank you, David. Um, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. <gasps> general welfare? General no. welfare? No. Who are these seditionists? Damn dirty bastards who wrote this. Well, Socialists. Yeah. Fascists. Uh, you, when you put it right over the plate, okay, I'm going to hit it out of Wrigley Field. Lower it down a little bit. <laughs> okay. I don't really need the mic, as you all know. People have the power to overthrow an empire. When we the people just keep writing and rewriting, editing and re-editing, reading and rereading, voicing and revoicing, sharing and resharing, listening and re-listening, working and reworking, organizing and reorganizing, and above all else, living and reliving together. We can't live on the linear. We can't put flags on the sun either. First and foremost, we are humans. Humans one of many together. We can't live off of currency. It can never buy us world peace. First and foremost, we are living beings, ones of many in a galaxy. And if we can't beat them, then live a long life reciting the reasons. All our dreams keep dreaming, keep dreaming about we. If we can't beat them, yet start again, rise, revive in the steps. Our stampedes keep returning, keep returning to reach. Thank you, David Ramsey Steele, for another excellent, exciting talk about why every day it's a getting closer, running faster than a roller coaster. Systematic change is coming to the USA. Every day it's on all our minds. We can see it in each other's eyes. Stop the change. 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 Stop the Look forward to seeing you, David, next year during the inauguration of the first ever Democratic Socialist President of the United States. <laughs> All right. Next. Who's rebutting next? Go ahead. Let's go. Thank you again, Dr. Steele. It was a very interesting presentation. I'd also read the article. Um, which is why I knew that you had discussed Zave Sternhell, James Greger, uh, Roger Griffin, and Stanley Payne and their analyses of fascism. And I'll throw these names out there just so maybe you could get to them if there's closing remarks. Um, I mentioned Daniel Ziblatt earlier. Some of you might know he co-wrote the book How Democracies Die. And before that, he'd written a book about the role of uh, conservative parties in the birth of democracy, and he compared Britain and Germany, if you know that study, where it's the conservative parties that accepted reform and adaptation that allowed democracy to form as much as the uh, left-wingers or progressives agitating for it, and that when that happened in a Britain with the Tory party, we were able to form a modern constitutional democracy versus the case of the Weimar Republic where the traditional conservative parties wouldn't play along and ultimately gave into uh, the Nazi movement as their ally, which then would overshadow them. And I wanted to um, emphasize that because that's the, the counter-interpretation. Uh, 
Uh, Eugene Weber, if some of you remember the show, uh, his lectures on the history of the Western tradition from the end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s, you can find them online. Um, and he looked at something, I know you talked about in the article, the pre-World War I roots, and that, that's the other big school of interpretations about fascism differs between the, it's an immediately forming move or accelerating movement in the crisis after World War I and the Russian Revolution and the social standoffs in the different post-war countries versus the, looking for the fin de siècle roots or the late 19th century nationalist roots. Um, that mixture of left and right, uh, the reactionary modernism from Jeffrey Herf or Francois Furet's idea that communism is a movement that is totalitarian in much the way that that group of right-wing regimes uh, or fascist and Nazi regimes are but it's the fulfillment of the Enlightenment for Stalinism versus the rejection of the Enlightenment for the reactionary modernist or fascist or Nazi types. Um, Weber also, in this book I have of his from the 60s, or Weber, he, I think he was the French pronunciation of his name, uh, Varieties of Fascism, talked about the different, yes, the specific variations in some countries, and Ivan Behrens talked about this in Eastern Europe too, the, all of this traditional right-wing ruling parties and social classes, the churches, tended to find some modus vivendi with the fascist movement, whether they were distinct from them or not, or playing the sort of like, well, these are movements with uh, left-wing origins, I think sort of ducks that question, which I know you got into in, in the article, because I read that more. Uh, you got into it more in that article. My hint about uh, neo-fascism today, I guess we would have to, again, like when people play these games about social democracy versus Stalinism as both being socialism. I'd be, I guess, particular with my terms about the paramilitary type posers in Europe versus the uh, softer far right, uh, the right wing nativist okay, parties. Let's, uh... And I'll, I'll give in to Tim's uh, request that I wrap this up. Oh, one thing I'll, I will also say just to Dave Zucker, uh, it wasn't just the weakness of the Italian monarch at the time. I know that unified Italy itself, since the Risorgimento had been beset by corruption, it was relatively less developed than the other big states of Western Europe. Uh, and the trasformismo, the corrupt relationship between the major parties there, which also caved in uh, along with the Italian church to endorse Mussolini. Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. I'll go next. It always amazes me how many of you guys are complaining about the state of the world and how much things have gone to hell in a handbasket. Yep. And about how much our world has uh, been frightful. Right. Well, I beg to differ because we have seen in the last 50 years alone some of the flowering of human knowledge, some of the trends for extension of lifespan, the elimination of hunger, the reduction of world poverty, all over the place, Charlie, if you just take a look at the statistics. I'll refer you specifically to a book by Johan Norberg called Progress, that it has taken a lot that a lot of times we humans and our species are doing a lot better than we ever have. Our world is working because of globalization and capitalism and free trade. It's extending benefits to us long after that we've been doing it and with our hyper-connected world with the internet today, we're able to spread ideas a lot quicker. But I will sound a warning because every generation has to sometimes relearn these lessons. A lot of our uh, Gen Xers and stuff are becoming uh, enamored with the false promises of socialism and are becoming a little more enamored with some of the premises of fascism. No. The thing that we must remember is the principles that were laid down back by Adam Smith and particularly our own government. That of freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of open ideas works. And the other point of the matter is 
we need to get along with each other and find out what we have in common instead of this perpetual uh, stirring up of hatred that we're seeing right now from our present administration. What I would really like to see is all of you take a good look at our modern life. Yes, I know there might be some issues with climate change, but we can solve this over the next few years. I've outlined myself the program at thorium reactors, but that's not the time or the place to say this. My faith is this. With a little bit of faith in humanity and its goodness, we might just be even better off in the next 50 to 100 years. And that, my friends, is something to celebrate. Celebrate global warming. Charlie, it's a, it's a. Tim's not pro global. Come on, Tim's not pro global. All right, Charlie. We argue with them all week. <laughs> all right. First of all, where's our speaker? There we go. Let's thank David uh, very much uh, for your contribution over the years in the collective body of literature that's in your book, which is available in the back. Um, it'll be eclectic, cover a few topics here. Uh, we talked a little bit surprisingly, I didn't think we talked too much about the Spanish Civil War. Um, I was going out with a young lady, she was a lefty, and uh, I told her I was reading up and knew all about the Spanish Civil War over her house, and then uh, her father said, uh, he said, I fought, you know, Chuck, I fought in it. He was a veteran of the uh, Spanish Civil War. And we hosted, had hosted them here many years ago at the College of Complexes. One thing I remember reading about it is talk about aristocracy. Um, after the, the things changed and the revolution in Spain, I still remember there were people that had they experienced such abject poverty that after the revolt, the revolution changed. That was the first time in their life they had ever tasted meat. They'd never eaten meat before. Um, so things changed. Another thing I heard of a small issue is the Patriot Act. Um, immediately upon passage of the Patriot Act, we put together a number of of individuals, concerned individuals, we still exist as a matter of fact. The CCCLR is the acronym, Chicago Land Coalition for Civil Liberties and Rights, which existed specifically to address concerns for the Patriot Act. Um, I not <coughs> kept up with it. I could check back with the ACLU and things like this. We put on conferences. However, it did not materialize into the nefarious piece of legislation that was concerned. I often hear it spoken of here. Uh, now I know there were certain elements of it that were not made public. We're fully aware of this, but needless to say, and I'm certainly aware under the Bush and Cheney administration that there were certainly were violations of human rights and privacy. Um, however, the Patriot Act, our group has kind of gone out of existence. We had people who were victimized by the Red Scare. I was involved in it because of intellectual freedom and use of library materials and things like that. However, it did not, we do not have evidence that, uh, it doesn't mean vigilance shouldn't have been taken, but nothing the fire has happened. Regarding that work of art, I like that neoclassicism, it has nothing to do with fascist salutes. Um, I always call it the, the oath of Horatio. There's a ratio, there was a famous hero in Rome called Horatio, the one arm and one eye. Uh, but I, it, I've never really, I, I was, that's not a fascist thing. They were, they were taking it all to swords uh, as he would raise your hand. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I, that's a, I realize that may be the, that's what's reported in the textbooks, but uh, no, I, I never associated that with the fascist salute. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, even that thing doesn't make any sense because they weren't going into battle 
they were gonna, it was like a contest between three guys and three on this side and three on this side. And it wasn't like heroic or something, you know, uh, like that. Uh, I've got something here about fascism, okay. which I don't know what to talk about, so I won't say anything. <laughs> Good idea, uh, Charlie. I will concur with you, you're entirely correct. The Night of Long Nights had nothing to do with Austria, like okay. he was talking about. Anyhow, thank you very much again. Look forward to it. We're going to see you in a little while here, you know. All right. All right, David. Thank you, you get the last word, Mr. Steele, so head on up. Dr. Steele. Dr. Steele. <laughs> All right, Dr. Steele, my apologies. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, I don't know, um, uh, on the fascists and race, I don't, uh, they didn't have many dealings with Slavs or people like that, but, um, uh, so I don't know what they would have done. Uh, they certainly uh, treated the, the, the people in the colonies that they created, Libya and um, Abyssinia, they treated them very badly, but I'm not sure how much of that was based on race, just based on the idea that these people were culturally um, very backward and that they were taking over and civilizing them and raising them up, which was the general view of colonialism at that time. Um, uh, I don't think the Nazis ever claimed to be a third way, uh, whereas the, the, um, uh, the fascists very definitely did. Uh, and I think, I think actually fascist thought was influenced by the, uh, the Catholic encyclicals, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Quadragesimo Anno and, and its predecessor, um, but, um, where the Vatican came down heavily against both socialism and laissez-faire capitalism, and that, so that, that it's notable that um, the fascism, in its in its strictest sense, is very much a phenomenon of Southern Catholic Europe, uh, and I think that that was uh, and, and also the whole idea of corporatism uh, is very much a kind of a kind of based on this Catholic. Uh, um, a certain strain in Catholic thinking that really regrets that we're not in the Middle Ages, uh, and that was the better kind of society, a more organic kind of society. Um, uh, well, the idea that the Belgians and other peoples never surrendered, the point is they didn't face the choice uh, of having part of their territory occupied, and then the Germans saying, we're prepared to stop here as long as you come to an agreement with us. They weren't, they, the, the, these other countries, the Germans just overran the whole country quickly. Um, uh, uh, or in the case of, the, of Poland, they overran half of it and waited for Russia to over, overrun the other half. Uh, in the, France was unique because um, uh, the, the Germans had an, an incentive not to occupy the whole of France. No. Uh, be too costly, and so they, they did something. They gave the French an offer that the other people didn't have. Um, uh, the idea that nation, nationalism, we shouldn't assume that every time we find nationalism, it's indicative of fascism. Um, I can't think of anybody more nationalistic in his outlook than Winston Churchill, for example. Uh, so lots of very democratic people uh, have been um, nationalistic. It's nothing that doesn't necessarily. Uh, by the way, uh, it's of no great importance, but I don't think that Bernie Sanders is anti-Semitic. And uh, for that matter, neither do I think that he believes that a, a woman can't be president. Um, but, um, okay, uh, I may have got the Balbo and Navy Pier thing wrong, but um, uh, I did read the book by Segre, uh, Italo Balbo, A Fascist Life, and he says that uh, the planes, these were seaplanes, by the way, they, they had they floated on the water, they were meant to land on water, uh, that they were moored at, at, uh, at Navy Pier. Um, so um, it's the, myth, the myth that big business bankroll Hitler has completely been exploded, if you read Ashby Turner's book, uh, Big Business and, and the Third Reich. Um, uh, is that big business supported anybody but Hitler, actually, or anybody but Hitler or the communists. Um, and um, of course they supported him once he came to power and it, it became um, it, it, injudicious to refuse to support him. But uh, up until then they supported opponents of Hitler. Um, uh, they didn't like the radicalism of the Nazis. Um, so <clears throat> the only, the, I would like to briefly uh, just make a couple of remarks about what I didn't say in my talk because of uh, lack of time. And that is, um, the situation in Europe that gave rise to fascism was the same situation that gave rise to Bolshevism. Um, and it's a situation where um, 
liberalism, or as we would say libertarianism, classical liberalism, uh, at a peak in the middle of the 19th century and then started to decline. Socialism started coming in. But then what a lot of people don't understand is that in the 1880s and 1890s, socialism went into a severe crisis intellectually. Uh, there were so many attacks on socialism. And these attacks came from the fantasy of, uh, way of thinking, which was that um, the progress of rationality had been overvalued. Uh, and it, it was a kind of disenchantment. It wasn't a complete rejection of progress of rationality, but it was the idea that these have been overvalued. And so, um, and so you have both. Uh, it's interesting that the, the Communist International and the fascist movement were launched at about the same time in 1919. Um, and um, the communist movement broke with uh, the, the socialist movements all over Europe and called upon its members to, um, <coughs> to come out of those uh, socialist parties and join the only true socialist party which would take its orders from Moscow. Uh, so you, uh, and so in, in different ways, they're both um, both communism as we now know it, Bolshevism, which called, started calling itself communism in 1919, uh, and fascism have a common root. Uh, and they're both, I think, reactions to the fact that people have lost faith in, so, in both liberalism and socialism, there was a gap. Uh, and they're both reactions to the fact that the world had turned out in a way that Mar Marx had predicted couldn't possibly happen. All the things that Marx predicted were not happening. Um, and um, so um, uh, this gave rise to um, socialism in one country in the, in the uh, uh, comparatively backward Soviet Union, and it gave rise to, uh, the, in the poorer countries like Italy, to this, uh, this idea that we, that we need a nationalistic form of, uh, of anti-liberalism, uh, in, in, and that took the took the form of national syndicalism, which became fascism. Okay, are you all set, Mr. Steele? I'm all set for what? Yeah, okay. Why don't you course. go ahead and gamble us out and wish everybody a good night, then? Yes. Uh, I wish everybody a good night. How about your conflict is adjourned. Thank you, David, again, for a good night. Yeah. Call allegiance to this.